<laughs> Welcome to Chase Oaks. We are so glad that you have joined us this weekend. Uh, we are continuing a series called The Power of Everybody. We've been looking uh, at the book of Nehemiah, looking at what can happen when everybody plays their part. They're trying to rebuild a wall in Nehemiah chapter 3, and it's significant because... Uh, one, it's got spiritual significance. For them, it's giving them uh, their, their identity back as a Jewish people. Also, it's got physical significance because it's providing uh, defense from uh, foreign enemies. And so this project is very important to uh, Nehemiah, who is a layman. He's a, a CFO to, to a king, and his heart is broken for this project. And so you see remarkable leadership and him gathering a group of people together that normally wouldn't get together, but they did and accomplished something really, really great. And so this weekend, we are going to unpack Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, my hope and prayer is that as we unpack this chapter together, that we begin to see the world differently, and not just the world, but your world, your community. Dare I say... Uh, I hope that you begin to see your church differently. And maybe this isn't your church, maybe you're visiting, but maybe you even see the church a little bit different this week. Because uh, I have about, you know, about seven different families in my life right now that are searching for a church home. So they're looking for a church, so they're church shopping. There's no better city to church shop than Dallas, Texas, okay? Like, they got options. It's a buffet, all right? Like, like you can hit seven churches in a weekend and still be like, eh, I don't know. And so they're, they're in the church shopping phase of, of, their, of their life, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just interesting to me how most people evaluate a church. And so their parents, and so naturally for them, they're evaluating churches based off of the children's and, and student ministry experience. If they show up and they see snot-nosed kids, they're like, this ain't for us, and, you know, they're just trying to back away from that. They're checking out the greeters. They're checking out, you know, do their teenagers connect, and teenagers are pickier than the parents. It's crazy. And so they're like, all right, so that, that's one thing that they can do to evaluate the church. And then secondly, it's music and worship. And everybody's got a different musical preference. Some people want the choir. They want gospel music, country music. Some people want hip-hop. They're like, you guys don't have any rappers here. I'm like, give us a break. Like, what do you want from us? And so uh, they, they, they're like, man, can you do more Bethel? Can you do more Elevation? You know, everybody's kind of got their Spotify playlist that they're walking in with, wanting the church to do it. Sometimes we do your song. Sometimes we don't. And so, so that, that's one, uh, a second box that you got to check is the music box. And then there's the preacher box, which is the pickiest of them all, which Good luck, you know, because this this guy or gal has to be funny, entertaining, relatable, got to have some data. They got to know some stuff about politics. And, and depending on where you swing politically, they got to be right wing, left wing. And if they're neutral, you're like mad at them. They're like, no, you pick a side. And so there's there's all this stuff. And, and so they, they've got all of these boxes that these churches have to check. And here's the deal. I think that's church human nature. Like, I don't even knock that. But, but here's what I would love to add. I'd love to add a box. I'd love to add a box to your perspective and their perspective and my perspective. Imagine if you and I looked at the church and said, not only is this a place that my, my kids love, not only is this a place where we like the music, and not only is this a place where we like the guy, and hopefully I say something this week and I'd add some value to your soul. But... Imagine if we had a box that said, is this a place where God could use me? Is this a place that my family could engage in the work of the Lord? Is this a place where my gifts could be used? Is this a place that I could serve? Is this a place where I could embark on the mission of God with my family? Is this a place where my family or me could meet a need? And what if it isn't about the show and what this place can do for me? What, what if I'm here to do something for this community? It's the fourth box. I think it should be the first box. I, I can just only imagine what would happen in your life if you walked into a church and said, 
Lord, have you called me here? Lord, what have you asked me to do here? You may not even be a Christian. You may be here. Maybe your friend tricked you into coming. They told you they were taking you to, to, to get a meal, and you popped up here. And they're like, what are we stopping here for? Oh, I just got to say hey to some people, and, and here you are. So <laughs> I can only imagine what would happen in your life. If you said right now, Lord, maybe I'm not here on accident. And I can only imagine the power of when everybody believes that they have a part to play. That's the framework I want us to have as we unpack Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, on the onset, if you're just reading Nehemiah chapter 3 by yourself, you're going to see a bunch of names and a bunch of gates. And on the onset, you're like, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. The gates, I mean, when you look at the gates, uh, you got the sheep gate, it's for sheep, um, fish gate for fishermen, old gate for old people, I don't know, valley gate, uh, it led to a valley uh, dung gate, it was for like waste and trash. Uh, fountain gate it led to a pool. Uh, water gate, not the one from the 80s, but uh, water gate uh, led to spring waters. Uh, horse gate for horses, military. Uh, east gate, it faced the east, which was very significant because of a prophecy that the uh, Messiah would return uh, coming from the east. So that gate was very important. The inspection gate this is where troops were inspected. And so the project in and of itself is a total of about, uh, about two mile, a two mile wall project. And Nehemiah is rallying people to rebuild this wall. Now, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1 says this. It says, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren and the priests and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it then as far as the Tower of Hananel. The first thing that I think we can glean from Nehemiah chapter 3 is that this was a spiritual project for them. This wasn't just uh, a community project. No, they said, we are doing something that we feel is sacred. And I don't know about you, but... Do you have anything in your life that's still sacred? Anything in your life that you've consecrated? Consecrated, it may seem like an old school word, but consecrated was simply meant to be something that we set aside for God. We make it holy. Uh, it's something that we say we preserve. Like we, we want this to dedicate this to, to God. Do you have anything in your life that is that, that you've consecrated? That's the beginning of Nehemiah Chapter 3, and then um, I love what we see in Nehemiah 3, verse 5. It says, next to them, the Tekhoites made repairs, but watch this, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. So now we've, we've got a, a group of people that they don't have great leaders, but they didn't let not having great leaders keep them from being a part of a great work. And I think for some of us, when we think about being involved, when some of us think about engaging in our community, we think, well, <laughs> well, you can think of five people that aren't doing anything. You're like, see, they're not doing anything, so therefore, why do I need to do it? And so, and if they would, then I would. And they... But the Tikhoites, I, I like these people, because they're going, I'm not going to let my leaders determine how I live. And I, I know a lot, like a lot of people, they just got bad bosses, which makes them believe that they've got the right to do a bad job. But here's the great news. It doesn't matter what kind of leader you have. It doesn't matter what kind of excuse you have. You have the ability to say, Lord, I'll work for you. And so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life as best as I possibly can, regardless of if I have the support that I think I should have. We're not always going to have ideal circumstances. And one of the things that can often happen whenever people try to get engaged in a small group or start serving is uh, usually people fall through the cracks when it starts being inconvenient. As soon as it gets inconvenient, 
Come on, man. No, I, I, y'all ain't got an app for that. Come on, man. I need, I need, I need to be able to like, it needs to be simple. It needs to be. And so we've got all of these prerequisites before we will fully engage in what God has put on our heart and nudged us to do. But I, I, but this is what you got to see about the, the, the techoids. In verse 27, it says, after them, the techoids repaired another section next to the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. So now you've got a group of people who who have legitimate excuses to be like, hey guys, sorry, you see our leaders, sorry guys, do the best that you can. They finished one part of their project and said, is there anything else that we can help with? you imagine if we all were like that? Can you imagine if we all decided to be extra mile people. Now here's what I've discovered. Every single one of us has an extra mile in us. Isn't it amazing? Like every single one of us has a mile in us and an extra one. But isn't it interesting? We kind of reserve that extra mile for very, very special circumstances. Imagine the power of all of us deciding to be the kind of extra mile people to say, you know what, Lord, if, if there's a work that you've called us to, we're, we're going to go above and beyond what we've been asked to do. I love what we see in verse 8. It says, next to him, Uziel, the son of Harahiah, one of the goldsmiths made repairs. So we've got a goldsmith here. Also next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs, and they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Um, if you are building a wall, you don't need gold. Uh, number two, you don't need cologne. So I'm just letting you know, in case you're wondering, uh, on what you will see in Nehemiah chapter 3 is priests, some dudes, uh, perfumers, goldsmiths. No construction experts have been called upon with this project. It's just a bunch of people that have just said, I'll play my part. Uh, what's your part to play? What's your part to play? What's your part to play in your community? What's your part to play in your neighborhood? What's your part to play at your job? Dare I say, what's your part to play in this church? I think all of us should be asking that question. What's our part to play? Because honestly, when I look at the scripture, I don't see a bunch of talented people. I don't see a bunch of gifted people. What I see in scripture is a bunch of people that simply said, okay. I think the greatest talent that we see in scripture is availability. It's just a bunch of volunteers that are going, all right, you want me to do that? All right, Noah. He is not a, a titanic expert, okay? He does not know how to build arcs. He's just going, I'll, I'll go to the desert, and I'll take a hammer and nail and some wood, and, and I'll follow your instructions. That, that's what I'll do. David, he's like, he's the last pick for a reason, my friends. But he's going, giant? Yeah, I got that. I'll throw a rock. We'll see what happens. Mary's a teenager. Nothing about her is qualified to raise a god. Like, think about this for a second. But God brought her a mission, and she just said, okay. You'd be surprised what could happen with you and I if we just decided to just say yes to God. Not because we're qualified, but, because, but just because we decided to make ourselves a little available. I just want to encourage the person here that just feels so unqualified to be used by God. What qualifies any of us is the willingness to simply raise a hand and say, Lord, use me. I love what we see next in verse 10. It says, next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumaf, made repairs in front of his house. Verse 28 says, beyond the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emmer, made repairs in front of his own house. 
I just, I want us to consider this weekend if there is a work to be done in front of our own house. Now, I know some of you might be looking at your grass right now. It's not growing the way that you want. You're like, Ryan, I got a lot of work to do in front of my own house. But I, I have to wonder what is it that God might be nudging us towards this weekend to be working on at our house. What is right in front of you that, that you're going, now nah, it, it's not that big of a deal, that, it, it's not that significant, but I just, I just have to wonder what, what could happen right, in, right up under your nose. Like, it's like we've all been given, like, something to take care of. Um, I love that I get to travel quite a bit, and whenever I'm, I'm flying over, kind of like middle America, you know, it's just tons of farms and just land on land on land. And, and if you're looking down, what you'll see is you'll see just a bunch of squares, right? Just tons of squares. And I heard my friend say this once. He said, man, it's like God's given each of us a square. Each, every, each and every one of us. It's like he's just given us just a little bit of a square to take care of. How are you doing with your square? Like, mine might look different than yours. But how are you doing with just yours? I mean, I, I just, you got to see uh, verse 30. It says, uh, after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanum, the sixth of Zalaf, repaired another section. After him... Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, made repairs in front of his dwelling. We moved from a house to a dwelling. Now, the, the Hebrew word here for dwelling is chamber. It was just basically like a little room. So everybody working in front of their house. And then you got Meshullam with this little dwelling. It's like people talking about their mansion, and then you're like, yeah, I got a studio apartment that I'm just doing the best I can with. It's like, but I just love that Michelle's like, but God gave me a dwelling. He gave me something little, and so I'm going to do the best I can with what I've been given and not compare my work to their work. And it's the power of everybody. When we all decide to say, Lord, if you've given me a dwelling, I want to take care of it. Lord, if you've given me a house, I want to take care of it. Lord, if you've given me a family, I want to take care of it. You may have, may have given me a small job, but I want to do that small job to the best of my ability. I might be the leader. And so, Lord, would you give me the grace and wisdom to do the best of my ability? But if something powerful happens when we all just look at our square and go, Lord, I want to do my best with my square. Whether it's a dwelling or a big house. How are you doing with your square? Uh, Nehemiah 3 verse 11 says, uh, Malchijai, the son of Harem, and Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section, as well as the tower of the ovens. Now, this may seem in, insignificant on the surface, because again, it's just a name, but this is also a man whose name was mentioned in a prior book, Ezra, as a man who was chastised for marrying a pagan wife. He had a negative connotation in one book of the Bible, but in this chapter, he's building. I just, I just want to give hope to anybody here today that's got some past failures. I want to give hope to anybody here who's gone through a divorce. Your marriage might be over, but your purpose is not. I want to give hope to anybody that's got some things in their past that they wish they could get back. I want to give hope to somebody that's made some pretty dumb decisions. You need no help beating yourself up over decisions that you have made. But what's interesting about people that have made really, really dumb decisions is they make another dumb decision, which is wallowing in their past dumb decisions. And so then they stay there. And then they stay emotionally stuck and spiritually stuck. And it's like they're imprisoned to what they did in the past. Not knowing, not realizing that they can make a new decision to still step into the purpose that God has for them. So I don't know what you've done. I don't know what's been done to you. But this I know. 
God has a plan for your life. And the deal's still on. And while you have some decisions and some failures and some things that you wish you could get back, God's going, you'd be surprised what could happen when you raise your hand and say, make yourself available and say, you know what? I'm in. Here's the deal. Uh, we, we don't know a lot about uh, Malchijah. We know he's in Ezra and we know he's in Nehemiah. What we don't know is the in-between. We, we, don't know, we don't know the story. And sometimes I love what the Bible doesn't say. It just allows us to imagine a man who turned it around. And despite his idiosyncrasies and despite his mistakes and despite his sin, he decided to pick up a hammer and decided to say, hey, I'm in. Imagine what would happen if all of us got past our past to be who God wants us to be. Verse 12. And next to him was Shalom, the son of Halohesh. Uh, this is what I want you all to do uh, over dinner at some point uh, over this weekend. I want you to read Nehemiah 3 out loud together. Okay, I want everybody to do it together and to see who can pronounce the names and it'll just be fun. Okay, so this is a leader of half the district of Jerusalem. And, th and, and this, is, this is the phrase I, I, I want us to see. It says, he and his daughters made repairs. When I say everybody, everybody. This is a family affair. We're all in it together. I just, I want you to begin to think about your family. I mean, just, I just want you to uh, imagine this for a second. You, you've got people that are hurting, that realize that they've, they've got a mission to accomplish. And, and at some point, some moms and some dads have to explain to their children why this is important. And it's one thing for them to say, hey, mommy and daddy got to go do this thing. But it's another thing to bring them along and say, hey, why don't, you, why don't you help rebuild this thing with us? And it just makes me think, man, what am I modeling for my kids? And what are you modeling for yours? And what was modeled for for you uh, i i grew up in the african methodist episcopal church if you don't know what that means it's just a black church and so it, it in these uh, in our services my dad was the pastor uh, we had about three hour services so we was there for a while you, you brought a snack at our church because you're gonna be there for a minute and we had uh, multiple choirs and specifically, we have multiple offerings you know it was like it, it wasn't just one time in the service where you could give it was like we we gonna have a love offering. If if the preacher did good, you gave him like a little extra tip. You know, it was like it was kind of it's kind of weird now to think about. It. Um, but but there's just all all of these these different offerings. And I remember my mother. She would I, I'd be sitting next to her, and if I started like doodling, I get pinched. You know, like really fast. Like hey, come on, pay attention in church. I'm like, can you sit here for three hours? And so, but I, I'll never forget. Every, every offering, my mother would reach into her purse and she would hand me a quarter, a dime, a dollar, a penny. And my mom would say, don't ever let an offering happen without giving something. Never forget it. It's how I was raised. And it's like people go, like my wife and I, like we just pride ourselves on just like the generous life. Like we just want to be generous. It's, it's the hallmark of our home. And it's like, like, man, where did this come from? I'm like, my mom put something in my hand to give. Small seeds that have grown today. And I, and I just think like, man, that was, that, that, that shaped me, that marked us and, and my family. Now, at some point, you got to start thinking, what is it about us that marks the next generation? What are we going to build together? Where can we serve together? How are you passing down the values that you have in your home? I love what Nehemiah 3, verse 22 says, and this is this is my favorite verse in Nehemiah chapter 3 because it has no names. Whew. 
It's awesome. And it sums up the whole thing. Like it sums up the whole project. You're going to love what it says. It says, uh, after him, the priest, the men of the plain made repairs. Men of the plain. They're just plain. Just a bunch of average Joes. We know nothing about them. You know, just ordinary men. Signed up for an extraordinary work of the Lord, which is something I think that we all that we all can really do together. In the coming weeks, you're going to hear about the Reimagine Project, which we're going to be looking at how we can show radical love to the DFW community. And and what I'm going to tell you is is This is not going to be a successful project without you. We need everybody. It's going to be uh, lots of conversations about what it looks like to reach this community in a different and perhaps unconventional way of what churches have done historically. And I'm going to ask that we all do our best to play our part. And, And lastly, I'm going to ask us all to do something this weekend that... It's, it's going to be interesting. Maybe you've done this before. Maybe you haven't. But I'm going to ask you to go to chaseoaks.org. And there's a section on the website uh, called the Do Good section. And you can actually find a Do Good project. And if you're an indoorsy person like me, you can check that. And then like only projects that are indoors will pop up. Or you can select outdoors and you can do those too. But as you can see, there are so many projects right now that you can sign up for and say, you know what, I'm in. I want to do good. And maybe you've gone here a long time and you didn't know that section was there. Most people don't go to their own church's websites, like not, 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 not that much of a thing. They're like, I already know where everything is and like giving's automatic. And then you start finding stuff on your own website. You're like, these are our beliefs. I didn't even know that. And, uh, so... <laughs> But, I, but I, I do want you to pray this weekend about how you can be engaged in your community. I, I think Chase Oaks has is, is, is got so much going on that sometimes the sentiment can be, y'all got it. Y'all got it figured out. Yeah, somebody is, but I, I don't know if you noticed on that little screen grab there, uh, there was something at the bottom of each project, and it was called Openings. Which means that there's openings, <laughs> spots for you. And I can just imagine what, what, what your life would look like if you weren't on the sidelines. I can only imagine what it would look like if we all just decided to say, you know what? Whether it's a, a do good project whether it's uh, serving in the children's ministry, whether it's holding a door, being a greeter, deciding to engage in the Do Good Center that feeds people each and every week. Our giving goes to a lot of these things. And, 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 and as somebody that lives, lives a generous life, there's some times where I feel, I'm just be honest with you, there's some times where I just feel like excused from the work because I wrote a check. It's kind of, I gave, come on, man, yeah, yeah. Why don't you get some of these lazy people to do something? You know, it's like. But, but what I love about Nehemiah chapter 3 is it's everybody. Yeah, we're all in this. We're all in this thing together. So uh, maybe, it's, maybe for you, it's going to chaseoaks.org. Do good. It's got a whole section. I mean, I was fascinated by. I was finding out stuff. I was like, man, I ain't know about this. I ain't know about this. I ain't know about this. And, and you could do stuff as a family. You could do stuff ju- just as you. Or maybe your spouse is like, I ain't doing that. That don't mean you can't. Be like the Tacoits. And say, hey, I, 
I know, I know it'd be great if the whole family could, but what if only half the family can? You might have one kid that says, I'll do it. The other one, I might never do it. Now. So, well, just take the one kid and don't feed the other one for a little bit and see what happens. <laughs> Starve them, you know what I mean? Till you feed some other people, we ain't going to feed you. You know, don't do that. It'd be mad. Don't get arrested. But I do encourage you to start praying about what it would look like for you to say, Lord, is there a need in this community? That you've set up for me to meet. And may we be the kind of people. That raise our hands. And simply say Lord. I'll be available. Despite my age. Despite my season. Sometimes it might be inconvenient. But I just got to tell you. When we all do it together. I, I truly believe with all my heart. We may not be able to change the entire globe. But I do think that we can make a pretty good dent in North Dallas. Lord, I thank you so much uh, for the opportunity that we have this weekend to study your word. Uh, I pray, God, that your word will continue to inspire us to live different, to transform our lives. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would show us the good work that you've set up a long time ago for us to play a part in. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to each and every one of us your unique plan for how we can make a difference in this community. And Lord, I pray that we would see a massive difference in North Dallas when we all do it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.